Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to start with a quick happy belated Thanksgiving to you all. It's my favorite holiday. Quick show of hands, who's still asleep? All right, trick question, because all of that didn't put your hands up. I'm assuming that your answer is yes for you. Um, we are continuing with our series about unexpected grace. And we've been following Moses and the Israelites who are in the Old Testament, they are God's people. And so we've been following and looking at ways that God showed grace to them and how that might impact us. And so I wanna to start today with a core truth that everything else that I say will be founded on, which is that in Christianity and what we believe here at Calvary is that Jesus is the center point. And so by that, I mean that the life and the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus is, we believe, the hinge point of all of human history. And so before that, people were viewed by God through the law. And since people couldn't upkeep the law, they were viewed through their sin. And after that, people are now viewed through the cross, which is a gift from God. And so relationship with God has been restored. So Jesus is the hinge point, but everything before and everything after hinges on Jesus. That is the core truth that I want to base on. Now, one really interesting thing about hinge, and I'm not very crafty. I was never gifted in arts and crafts, so I took the liberty of pre-folding this piece of paper for a visual aid, hamburger style. So one interesting thing about hinges is that you'll find that everything before the hinge points to the hinge, and everything after the hinge points to the hinge. So everything in the Old Testament points forward to Jesus, and everything in the New Testament points backwards to Jesus. And our lives today still point backwards to Jesus. But the other thing that's cool about a hinge, all of you carpenters who actually know about hinges are probably scoffing at me, but that's okay. The other thing that's cool about a hinge is that you can start to see parallels between the things that were before and the things that are after if you pay attention. You can start to see that the, the writing on this and the writing on this, when you put them together, there are some things that they have in common. And so with that being said, I want to recap where we have been thus far in the book of Exodus, looking at the people of Israel and it might take me a little while to get to the passage that we're reading today, but there's a reason for that, and I'll explain it as we go. So picking up where the Israelites picked up in their journey, they start out in a bad spot, and namely, they start out in slavery. So they're in Egypt. They are slaves in Egypt. They have no ability to break free from the external forces that are exerting their will against them. So this is their captivity, is in Egypt. And then... They experience this dramatic, miraculous intervention. And so God leads them in a pillar of cloud by the day and a pillar of fire by night. And then when their captors are bearing down on them to bring them back to slavery, God splits the sea in half so they can walk through on dry ground. And he brings the waters down on the oppressive forces that were following them. And so they go from captivity to miraculous deliverance. And it's not from a violent uprising. It's not from their own will. It's actually from placing their trust in the deliverance of God. And so we saw the Israelites in captivity, and then we saw them in this miraculous deliverance at the Red Sea. And then, in addition to being delivered, they are given assurance from God that he is going to lead them into a special land that, they, that he has promised for them, a land that is their inheritance. And so they call it the promised land. So they were in captivity, they experienced a miraculous deliverance, and they are given a future promise. But between the miraculous deliverance from bondage and the promised land that they are going to, they now live in a wilderness. They live in this tension where they're free from the bonds that they did know, but they haven't yet experienced the promise of everything that God has promised to them. And right now, they are traveling through strange places where things aren't always that great. And they experienced, in the weeks that we just covered, they experienced famine, and they experienced drought, and they actually wished that they could go back to the assurances and the false comforts that they experienced as slaves. And they cursed the same freedom, the same deliverance that they were praising God for the week before. And so they experience captivity, and then they experience miraculous deliverance, and then they have this future promise that God gives them, and then they live in a current wilderness. 
They go from Egypt to the Red Sea. They have the promise of the promised land, but for now, they live in the desert. Now, I firmly believe that God does not do anything by accident. And my question to you would be, do you notice anything familiar about their story? So I want to go through this again, but this time I want to look intentionally for the similarities. Like we talked about, I want to look for the parallels if the hinge point is Jesus. So the Israelites began their journey in captivity. Do you know anyone who is currently a slave to a force that they cannot overcome on their own? Have you experienced being a slave to a force that you cannot overcome on your own, whether that be an addiction, whether that be a depression? Have you experienced captivity that is, a, that is caused by sin? And so our journey as Christians actually parallels their journey, but our captivity is when we realize that we are captive to sin and we cannot overcome it on our own. Their journey is our journey. And for those of you who have placed in your faith in Jesus, you have now seen the miraculous sea-splitting freedom that comes from trusting God because while you may not have seen the physical sea split in half, you do understand that God sent his perfect son, Jesus, to experience death and separation from him because you deserved it. And so if you've put your faith in him, then you have likely lived through or maybe you've watched other people who have been delivered from those addictions or from chronic and repeated sin because they were loved by God and because of the cross of Jesus Christ and because they were loved by the church of Christ until you can't even recognize the person that they were before. My best friend growing up uh, was a young man who experienced a lot of things that truthfully I did not experience. But because I walked with him through those things, I got to see what it looks like when someone throws their hands up in the air and lets go and trusts God and let, stops trying to white knuckle their way out of an addiction or out of a depression or out of whatever the situation is. And I got to see God deliver him from his depression and I got to see God deliver him from his addictions. And now I get to see the incredible light that he has become to the people around him. The only difference between Christianity and atheism is that, because both are sinners, is that the Christian knows the freedom of the cross and they have experienced a life that they haven't earned. So their journey began in captivity. Our journey began in captivity. Their journey experienced miraculous deliverance. Our journey experiences miraculous deliverance. But I want to pause here because some of you might be like, wait, I still feel like I'm a slave to a force that I cannot overcome on my own. Like I, I've, I've experienced the freedom of Christ, but I still feel like a captive to something that I cannot overcome. And what I want to share with you is that there's an insight for you from the Israelites' story, and that is that you are not going to will your way out of captivity. You are not going to white knuckle your way out of captivity. You are not going to strive your way out of ca captivity. The best thing that you can do is put down all of the things that you are using to struggle with and ask for help. And if you feel like you don't know where to start, this is where the Israelites started. This is Exodus 2. During that long period, the king of Egypt died and the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out and their cry for help because of their slavery went, out, went up to God God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. And God looked on the Israelites and he was concerned about them. So if you want to know where to start, if you still feel like you're stuck, cry out to God. And you might be like, I did, I did that. I did cry out to God and I still feel like I'm stuck and I still feel like I'm in the same place. And there's a really hard secondary lesson that we can take away from the Israelites. And that's that God heard their cry and he sent Moses. And so if you've cried out to God in your captivity, then look for the people who he has placed in your life, who he might use to help you walk out of your captivity. Who has God placed in your life to help you out of captivity? And if you're like me, it's way easier to open up to God in prayer privately and way harder to open up to the people who I'm closest with in my life. But I have done it. And if you've done it, then you know the same thing that I know, which is that you breathe so much fuller after you have shared the thing that you are addicted to, after you've shared the thing that you can't stop thinking about, even though you know it's wrong, after you've shared the thing that you're afraid of, you breathe deeper. 
And then you've either experienced one of two things. You've experienced a great thing with someone who loves God and loves you and they walked with you out of your captivity when the church is being the church. Or you've experienced the pain of being betrayed or abandoned by somebody who you trusted and now it's hard for you to trust anyone. And for you, I would say two things. The first is that you are unlikely to trust again in the future until you forgive the person from your past. And the second is that you can be shrewd with who you trust. Look at the people who are in your life after you pray that prayer. Look at their relationships. Do their relationships bring about wholeness? Is the fruit of their life healing or are their lives marked by gossip? Do they handle conflict directly and graciously or do you watch them blow up on people? It is okay to be shrewd when you are looking for the people that God has placed in your life to help walk you out of captivity, but he calls us to look. So if you've cried out to God, there is freedom available for you no matter how long you have been a captive. And that's hope this morning. It doesn't come from strong arming your way out. It comes from throwing your hands up in the air and asking God for help and then looking for the people who he is placing in your life to walk with you. So as Christians, we know captivity. We also know a miraculous deliverance. Theirs was at the Red Sea and ours was on the cross. And for those of you who have placed your hope in Jesus, you also believe that God has prepared an inheritance for you in heaven, a place where everything that was wrong will be made right again. And so they had a future promised land in Canaan, and we have a future promised land in heaven. So again, their story is our story. And finishing it out, don't we now live in this incredible and yet heartbreaking already but not yet state where we have experienced joy and freedom that is brought by Jesus and our world still engages in child slavery? We've seen the chain-breaking power. I talked about my friend, the chain-breaking power of the Holy Spirit. And at the same time, I watch the people who I love become unraveled by addictions every day. We have the beauty of an encouraging and affirming church and relationships. And then in the same breath, we cuss out the person who crossed us in traffic. Don't we live in a wilderness tension where we're freed from bondage and we see the promised land in front of us, but right now we're living in the middle and sometimes it couldn't be better and we see God left and right and other times we just want to lose ourselves in the things that we were addicted to, in the sins of our past all over again, if it would just get me out of this place. So as Christians, we live a fascinating parallel to the Israelites in the book of Exodus. And here's why that's interesting, is because today's verses are the last verses in the entirety of the book of Exodus. And I want to look at what is the lasting memory? What is the last thing that God wants to tell us about this Exodus journey with the Israelites? And so a little backstory, what you need to know is that while they were in the wilderness, God instructed the people to build a tent of meeting. We call it the tabernacle, um, which is a fancy word to say tent of meeting. He gave them crazy specific instructions and told them who was going to make it. He told them what materials they were going to use. He told them what they were going to put in it. And I don't have time to go into detail on all of the items that were in the tabernacle today, but there were items that were reminders of God's deliverance. There were items that held his law for people to live holy lives. There were items that were designed for people to bring sacrifices because again, they were seen through sin. So they would bring sacrifices as atonement, as, as, as a relationship repairer for their sin. And so they spend five chapters and a lot of man hours building this tabernacle. And then finally it's complete. And so these verses complete the book of Exodus. And if you remember, I talked about uh, God led them in a cloud when they were, when he was leading them out of Egypt. And you'll see something interesting happen with that cloud here. This is Exodus 40. It says, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day that it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day and fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. So what is the last impression that God wants to give us about the wilderness? It is that he is promising his continual 
presence and not just his presence, but his glory. And not just that it's there, but that it's visible in front of the Israelites wherever they go. But if their story reflects our story, then this is where things can get a little confusing because, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> this is where things will get a little confusing. Uh, have you ever read a children's book in which the main character um, has one of those rain clouds that hovers over their heads? And it's like, no matter where they go, it could be sunny everywhere else in the world, but wherever they go, the rain pours on them and they're usually pretty unhappy about it. I have wondered many times why God does not give me that cloud to follow around. Like if he gave the Israelites a cloud where they could visibly see proof of God all the time, why can't I have that? Like, have you never wondered, like, you, have you never asked God for something and been like, I don't even know if you're there. Like, could you just give me some semblance of proof that you're listening, that you're there, that you're going to show me what direction I can go. And so I look at the Israelites and I'm like, okay, they got a cloud. Where's my cloud? Have you ever wondered that? Like, where is God when I am talking to him? Why won't he show me what direction I am supposed to go? And so the question is, if our story is paralleling their story, why doesn't God give me a cloud to follow around so I can have proof of him all the time? And when someone's like, I don't believe God is real, I'm like, look at that cloud. Why doesn't God give us a cloud to follow around? And the answer is, it would not matter if he did. You see, if I could see the cloud wherever I went and I still experienced suffering and I still experienced difficulty, then I would still experience the same feelings that God is abandoning me or that he doesn't care about me. We think that visibility is the problem, that if we could see God and if we had proof, it would all be okay. Visibility is not the problem. Sin is the problem. And our feelings of abandonment and our inability to follow God in obedience, they're about sin in our lives and sin in our world. They're not about whether or not we can see proof of God's existence. You want proof of that? Adam and Eve walked with God in the perfect garden of Eden, and then the serpent came and he offered them the opportunity to become God, and they took it and they ate it. The prophet Elijah prayed for fire to fall from heaven, and it did in the sight of all the people. And right after that, the queen said she was going to kill him, and he ran to the wilderness, and he asked God to kill him there. Moses, earlier in our series, we talked about the burning bush. He met God in a bush that was on fire and would not be consumed. And in the same conversation, he told God, I will not go unless you send someone to speak on my behalf. The Israelites, they watched God part the Red Seas so that they could walk out of captivity. They had the miraculous deliverance. They watched God hover over a mountain and give Moses the Ten Commandments. And while they could see that happening in the distance, they built a golden calf and worshiped it. And what you'll see if you come back next week is that even the glory of God coming down and making a home in the tabernacle was not going to be enough to stop the Israelite people from doubting and disobeying and acting in fear, even though they could see God. Visibility is not the problem. Sin is the problem. And I've looked at the Israelites and said, if I could see God the way that they could, I would always trust him. I would always obey and I would always do what was right. <clears throat> and I was talking to my friend this week and he brought up something that I've really never thought about before, which is what do you think that they would think if they could see us? Wouldn't they say, hey, those people have the literal words of God in their pocket everywhere they go. Hey, those people can look back and see the cross and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus at any time. Hey, those people live with the Holy Spirit inside of them. How could they possibly have more faith in their political party or policy than they do in the God who saved them from sin and death? How could they possibly find more security in money than they do in trusting the Holy Spirit to lead them and guide them? How could they possibly not trust and obey God all the time? Wouldn't they say that about us? Proof won't change your life. Not the way that you think it will. 
So what will? I want to look back at the tabernacle one more time. These are the same verses. Exodus 40 says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In the travels of all the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day that it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the Israelites in all their travels. So to this point, the pillar of cloud and fire that the Israelites have followed, it had led them out of Egypt. It had led them across the Red Sea. And then it had gone up on Mount Sinai, I talked about earlier, to give Moses the law. And then it had rested in a separate tent of meeting that was outside of their camp where Moses specifically would go and speak with God. But now, for the first time, God is going to make his home or his dwelling among people. God is going to put down roots in the tabernacle with the Israelites. Why is this significant? Because it is the first installation of the salvation plan that God began when Adam and Eve first sinned, when they broke the relationship between creator and creation, because now God is going to begin to build that bridge that we had broken. Because in the tabernacle, God will dwell among humans consistently in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of, or sorry, in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. And at the tabernacle, people will come and they will make sacrifices that are temporary sacrifices, but will allow God to look at them without only seeing their sin. And through the tabernacle, God will lead his people through the wilderness. And as his presence moves, they will move. So God is putting roots down with people in the tabernacle, but the tabernacle is not the last time that God will make his dwelling among people. This is John chapter one, speaking about Jesus. It says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. The tabernacle points us to Jesus. Because in the tabernacle, God will dwell with humans in a cloud of glory. But in Jesus, God will dwell among humans as a human who experiences friendship and betrayal and joy and pain and peace and temptation. At the tabernacle, people offer sacrifices from an imperfect world for the temporary redemption of their sin until they have to come back and offer another sacrifice. But in Jesus, God will bring the sacrifice. And it won't be a temporary sacrifice offered from this world. It will be a permanent sacrifice offered from heaven. Completely perfect for the redemption of every sin that was and every sin that will be done. Through the tabernacle, God will lead his people through the wilderness, but in the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, God will send his spirit to live inside of people, and that spirit will lead them, will lead us through the wilderness that we live in now until we experience the reality of eternity in heaven. I told you proof will not change your life the way that you think it will. Proof will not change your life, but faith will. Faith that Jesus lived as the glory of God in a man. Faith that his death and resurrection, because of that, you have eternity in heaven with God. Faith that the Holy Spirit can help you to follow after Jesus now. And you don't have to wait for heaven to experience the beginning of fullness. It's easy. We can do that. I believe that Jesus was God. I believe that he died on the cross. I believe that the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. It's easy. Accept. Except if we believe that, it means that we have to believe what Jesus said. And if we believe that, it means that we have to believe that we are broken enough to need saving. And if we believe that, it means we have to trust the Holy Spirit to lead us more than we trust us to lead us. That's what changes your life. That's faith. It's not saying that I believe these things. It's listening to the words of Jesus like, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. 
Faith is believing that if Jesus says, if you're offering your gift at the altar and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come offer your gift. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. So if we believe that Jesus is who he says and we believe that the Holy Spirit speaks to me, then all of a sudden those words mean a lot more and my life is gonna involve a lot more submission and a lot less doing whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it. That's what changes your life. See, if Jesus is really God dwelling among people, then he's more trustworthy than I am. And he's more trustworthy than what I think should be true in any given situation. And he's more trustworthy than what I feel in any given situation. And then all of a sudden it's not so easy. Even if we think it's true, it's not easy to follow Jesus because it takes faith. And proof won't change your life, but faith will. If you want to change, if you want to experience more of God, you don't need more proof. You need to grow your faith. And so then the question is how? How do you grow your faith? And what I will tell you today is that I'm not gonna tell you to do new things, anything new from what maybe you're already doing. I'm just going to tell you to look at the things that you are doing differently because what it takes to grow faith is intentionality in our relationship with God. All healthy relationships take intentionality. Kaylee and I have been married for four and a half years. We're really looking forward to year five because at the wedding dances where they say, if you've been, dancing, been married for one year, you can go off. They always jump directly to five. They don't do two, three, or four for whatever reason. We've been married for four and a half years, and I know that's not a long time, but what I have learned is that I do not grow in my love or my trust or my desire for her by accident. I, I do, I grow in those things because I am intentional about the time that I spend with her and how we use that time. Growing a relationship takes intentionality. And if you want to grow in your relationship with God and you want to experience him more, then what you need to do is to be intentional about the time that you are spending with him and how you are using that time. And this is tough because it's not cookie cutter. Like I'm not gonna tell you all to do the same exact thing. We're not all the same people. Our rhythms and the ways that we relate to God and our schedules are all different. Our faith journeys are not in the same spot. And so intentionality looks different for different people. But... That's what it takes. And so a couple of things for me that I do in terms of intentionality, um, in terms of worship, obviously I love worshiping God, um, but I worship in the morning. So the first song that I listen to, wherever I'm driving to, the first place that I'm going for my day, I will listen to worship music. Because to me, I'm like, this is my intentionality is I'm gonna start my day this way. And it's not, it's not like I only listen to Christian music, though if that's you, you do your thing. But it's not like I only listen to Christian music. I just, it's the first thing. It sets my heart right if the first thing that I listen to is about God. And then when I'm reading my Bible, I've learned that for me personally, I have to take time to learn the Bible. Like if I just read the Bible, I'm like, what the heck does that mean? But if I take the time to read somebody else's notes about it on the, the free ones from the Bible app, or if I buy a book that teaches me about what Paul was writing about when he wrote to the Corinthians, those are the things that help me. Those, that's my intentionality in my Bible reading is I don't just want to read it. I want to understand it. And in my prayer time, I found that my intentionality looks like I set a timer for two minutes and I sit there in prayer and I listen because it's really easy for me to talk and it's really hard for me to listen. So I set a timer for two minutes and that's what intentionality looks like for me. And it's not gonna look the same for you. But if you're looking for a specific one, two, threes and practicals, I wrote down some first steps of intentionality on a piece of paper and I left them on the stage. If you look stage left and stage right. I left them on the stage and I also left them on the welcome center and you are welcome to come and pick them up. But the point is to have a plan to be intentional about your relationship with God. Because if you want to grow in your faith and you want to experience more of him, it starts there. And the bad news for those of you who are like me and often feel like you have it together is that you're probably gonna mess up a bunch of times and there are probably gonna be a lot of days where you're like, I had no intentionality about my relationship with God. I don't even know if God knows that I was alive today. First, good news, he did. Second of all, the nature of God is that he is merciful and gracious and he's slow to anger and he's abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness and he forgives sin and he upholds justice. 
So just like there was patience for the Israelites in the wilderness, there's patience for you and yours. I'm gonna invite the worship team out. So to recap, if you want to experience God consistently in your life, build faith. It will take intentionality and it will take sacrifice. And there is no relationship in life that does not take work. But what you will find is that the God who led the Israelites out of the wilderness by the power of his presence has not changed. His desire for you now is the same that his desire for him, for them was then. And that is nearness. He wants you to know that he is near to you. He wants to lead you through this life and he has plans for you in it. And this is the best part of all. This is from Revelation 21, talking about the end of time. It says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. We're not just gonna have a cloud, we're gonna have God himself. He will dwell with his people in perfection. In the temporary tabernacle, this glorious spirit-filled tent that you live in right now is not your eternal home. God is preparing a place where his presence will be with us always and where he will personally wipe away our tears and where we will be with him in completeness and perfection. And that's good news. I'm actually gonna invite you to stand as we close and worship together. So today, experience freedom in tension. Be intentional in your relationship with God. Grow in your faith. It will change your life and know that he who promised is faithful and a day is coming when God himself will dwell with people and we will worship him with the Israelites of old and the angels and the saints. And we will all look at the King of Kings and we will say worthy of honor and power and glory is he. But the good news is that we don't have to wait till then to join that song. We don't have to wait till then to begin to experience fullness. We can do it now. We can join the song now. And so we're gonna sing that he is worthy of it all. Because he is. And we will sing this song now and we will sing it into eternity. Let's sing together.